extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for two hours of news and opinion you could only get from GraniteRock.com. Rock Talk. Yes, it's another edition of Rock Talk, where we are the extreme right, which means they are the extreme right. Wrong. Welcome to August 9th, 2014 from Concord, New Hampshire. I am here with Skip Murphy sitting across the table from me and Mike Rogers, who is not in California, who is in Ohio. But he's on the phone with us. I've got a question. Yeah. How come I'm an extremist? Just because I believe in the Constitution. Yeah, you see, you're extreme because you don't think, you think people make better decisions with their own money than those lunatics down in D.C. Or Concord. Or Concord, yeah. And sometimes my own city hall. <laughs> yeah, quite often. <laughs> <laughs> you think? Think I've said enough? Well, I think well, so. you, you've, you've actually tried to do city hall budgeting, haven't you, Skip? And it's a hell of a fight to get them not to just spend every penny that the town earns. Oh, uh, you, you can't believe it. Uh, it's Every single penny is sacred. It's always for the children. And how dare you cut us to the bone. It's always about the quality of life. Yeah, and I keep coming up with that syndrome of Parks and Recs when I look, first got on the budget committee saying, you ran this program, right? It cost you how much? How many people attended? Well, that's $200 a head. And everybody around the table went, what? And everybody who was a Park and Rec and big spender out in the audience just gasped. And they, boy, did they try to shut me up real quick. I said, uh, do the math, guys. And I still have yeah. a problem with my town of Guilford, who, who basically keeps a paid staffer who spends part of his time going to the other side of town, to the Gunstock Ski Area, so he can buy some passes at a cut-rate deal to distribute to residents of Guilford, in which Gunstock resides. It's like these moms and dads can't band together voluntarily and go over and say, hey, we want to buy X number of passes. Give us a break. No, we have to have government at one level go to government at another level and use taxpayer-supported money to buy this stuff. It's just freaking insane. And I have a, a Bastiat quote right in front of me. Government is that great fiction through which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else. Yes. Bastiat's window. How dare you not give us money because we have to pay all these other vendors. They never mention the people from which they are taking the, the, the money. We're all bakers, if you remember Bastiat's broken window story. I'm actually reading the rest of the quote. What? Um, man recoils from trouble, from suffering, and yet he is condemned by nature to suffer of privation if he does not take the trouble to work. He has to choose, then, between these two evils. What means can he adopt to avoid both? There remains now, and there will remain, only one way, which is to enjoy the labor of others. Such a course of conduct prevents the trouble and the enjoyment from assuming their natural proportion, and causes all the trouble to become the lot of a set of persons, and the enjoyment that of another. So, anyway. Um, let's talk about some other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Why? This is basically the whole theme. This lately. really is. the. I, I mean, anybody, we talked about it when we had Ian on, and um, Carla. And, uh, you know, just, we were talking about books, and everybody was like, you know, Bastiat, just read Bastiat. I mean, you could, it's pretty easy to read. I mean, if you get his complete works, it's like 12 trillion pages. But, I mean, there's nuggets of wisdom in every single page. I mean, if you read this, he, what he says, and this is a guy in France hundreds of years ago who is talking about things that apply today, just like the founders did. I mean, you really, it isn't out of touch. It's human nature. It's government. And it's the abuse of power. And it, it's very simply explained, and you just read it, and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what's happening right now, you know? Yeah. It's not this strange alien concept that nobody's ever seen before. And I think it's getting worse and worse. I'm quite sure that, I mean, just look at the illegal alien kids who three-quarters of them are teenagers. They're going to get free education, free health, free housing. I mean, everything will be free as far as they're concerned. But guess who gets to pay for it? And it's for the children. It's for charity. No, government is not charity. Government is taxes, force, 
and delivery of said services. And they it's take not it. Charity. They don't take it from the rich because the rich get around it. There, all those rich liberals do. They take it in little gas taxes. They take it in rooms and meals taxes. They take it in property taxes. They take it in fees for this and fines for that, and and things you have to pay for to be able to get permission to do something that you shouldn't have to go to the government to get permission for, and so on and so on and so on. And they nickel and dime you to death. All those cups of coffee add up. Yeah. to a huge chunk of your yeah. income, and the pressure they create on the regulatory state makes it harder and harder for you to grow your own income. It, it's right. The only thing I, I, I'd object to there is saying that the rich get around it. The rich still pay far more taxes in total than the rest of us. That's true. Uh, if you, you know, 70% of the taxes are paid by the top 5 or 10% of people, and you know, the bottom 50% of the, of the income chain pay almost nothing in income taxes, of course. Due to the other depredations of government, they pay a tax just for being employed, called Social Security and Medicare. So there's, uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no way out from it, and that's one of the reasons why flat taxes or fair taxes are so appealing, because if they're done right, they get rid of those taxes on labor, uh, and it really is proportional to how much you spend or how much you make, depending on which type of tax you have. That's an important distinction because the rich do pay lots and lots of taxes, but in the grand scheme of quality of life and social ladder positions, generally speaking, what I really should have said correctly was that it doesn't have as big of an impact on their life. Yeah, I mean, you have these rich people who are like, what do you mean I have to pay $1.6 million in taxes? Well, you made $8 million or $5 million or whatever you did, so yeah, that's a lot of money. It's their money, and they earned it, and they deserve to keep it. Correct. But... Um, they're not going to be wondering how they're going to pay their phone bill or their electric bill or put gas in their car. I mean, really, that's more what I was talking about. No, they're not. But they're going to be wondering whether it's worth <laughs> employing another hundred people. Oh, absolutely, stuff. absolutely. And, and, you know, especially if government increases the tax another way by saying thou shalt pay more than the labor's worth. <laughs> now, I think uh, there's a couple of things that come into this lately that should be scaring the crap out of everybody. Once again, we're seeing people who are saying there shouldn't be a floor to uh, you know, uh, the, the living wage kind of folks that say, well, we need a living wage, so raise the floor up. But Kevin, I think it was Kevin Drum. I haven't posted it yet, but I've heard this before. You should not be able to make above a certain limit. And this influential blogger basically said, if you earn up to $500,000, everything else, you have to be forced to give away. Still your money, but uh, but you're going to give it away. You can choose the charity, but you have to give it away. Nobody will ever earn more than four ninety nine. Yeah, well, not only that, but here's the really scary part. We all, know, the, all of us who pay attention to this stuff, know that when a country starts putting on capital flight regulations, in other words, you can't move your money outside of the the U.S. borders or any borders, Venezuela, usually the banana republics. There's a huge problem brewing in that country, and now you're seeing the the, the Walgreens and some of these other companies, the uh, Pfizer, who wanted was it Pfizer or Merck? What are the two, the, the big phar pharmaceutical companies wanted to basically do what's called a tax inversion, buy a, buy a company in uh, Great Britain and then move their headquarters over there and basically not have to pay you conf what I consider confiscatory U.S. Uh, corporate taxes. And a hue and a whale has come up and the, the overlying theme that I'm seeing from the left is you will be depriving the government of billions of dollars. Damn right. And, <laughs> well, they're looking at it it's, as... It's their money, damn it. It is. Well, the, and that's the thing that the left doesn't understand. It really is they, getting they, to the point... They did build it. They, they did it. They the, built it. Every business owner built it. Yes, but the left is more and more going into this warrenism where oh, you yeah, didn't oh. build it. Obamaism, and they're saying with that threat of you're depriving the government of all that billions of dollars, they're basically saying that is government money, and that should scare the crap out of everyone. All our money is their money. It's right. None well, of it's ever yeah, been ours. I, I, yeah. I, I tell you what scares the crap out of me even more is watching the rising tide of socialist populism. Um, you know, uh, we are somewhere along the road to Argentina and Venezuela, and it's not going to be pretty if we let this continue. So 
you know, in, in terms of these inversions, we had Dick Turbin standing up in Congress about two weeks ago giving a long speech, which basically amounted to what Skip just said, that uh, a good corporation is one who keeps its headquarters here, pays its employees more than they're worth, and pays the government definitely more than it's worth. He didn't say those words, of course. Um, and, and an evil corporation is one who tries to avoid paying the taxes so they've got money to do something else, like reinvest it. Uh, well, you and, and I uh, were... You and I were bantering back and forth the uh, Roosevelt uh, Blue Eagle over the week in email. You know the uh, oh, national yes, the, the, the Nazi recovery organization <laughs> yeah, administration. Yeah, where uh, you know basically the propaganda was that a good housewife doesn't shop anywhere where they don't have the Blue Eagle, and of course you didn't get the Blue Eagle unless you agreed to the terms and conditions and the regulatory rules of the federal government. And so you were you were basically not segregated out as one of those bad businesses. Well, yeah, I, I, that's, 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 that's an economic uh, protectionism, mm -hmm. which is happening, by the way, rent-seeking protection, protection from gov well, by government. You know, nice little business you got there. Shame if we should find a regulation that interrupted it. <laughs> and more and more, we're actually starting to see that, and that is the sad thing. You know, this whole meme of economic patriotism. I'm sorry, but the socialists and the progressives always want to use the idea of war applied to the social environment, the social fabric. And I'm sorry, war is war. It should not ever be applied to regular civilian it's life. the moral equivalent of war. Yeah, the moral equivalent of war, where they can get everybody to line up and, and go forward. Now, Jonah Goldberg had a great piece that I posted part of it as a notable quote, where he basically said, you know, all of everything that we are having problems with now first started with Woodrow Wilson and World War One because the progressives saw we can actually make society act like a machine where all the individuals are mere cogs in it and we will have a totally ordered society. Now as a conservative I want an ordered society. An ordered society where individuals freedom and liberties are protected. They on the other hand look at the economy. They look at society as the greatest uh, goal and achievement versus I'm looking at the greatest amount of freedom for the individual within an ordered society, and they do not. You know, here's, what I, uh, here's what I wrote, because this is, I mean, if you, if you aren't sure that we're already there today when we talk about this Blue Eagle crap, um, what I wrote to Mike when he posted, sent that link to us was, sounds like the moral equivalent of war. Maybe we should just make a new customer protection agency, which we already have, in the Obama National Recovery Administration and tell citizens to only shop at businesses that display the Obama logo. Those that refuse could have their homes and businesses picketed by unions targeted by and targeted and threatened by the Gestapo, have their bank leaned on by the feds to stop taking their business or loaning them money, their customers scared away, their vendors harassed, get investigated by the IRS, FBI, EPA and Homeland Security, their emails could be read, their social media status examined, their facilities spied on, their friends and neighbors questioned, wait a minute, we already have that. We do. And that's the sad yes, part. Yes, we do. And, think, and thinking of that, uh, of course, there's the protected classes of business and the unprotected, uh, you know, where the government deems, uh, and, and I was reading a different piece, actually, I'll get back to a book by Steve Forbes, I was reading a different piece about how the regulators gradually constrain the banks and wonder why no loans are going out. And, and of course, the top target are any business concerned with guns, manufacturing, sales, whatever, which the government constrains the banks by declaring these businesses credit risks and therefore saying, if you want to carry this business on your books, we're going to downgrade your, your reserves. So you're either going to have to bulk up your reserves or stop doing business with these evil gun companies. And that is happening, you know, everywhere and always under this administration. Mike, and hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break and you can finish that because I know where you're going. Be right back. Stay with us. Few things are as important as finding the right doctor. And under Obamacare, that's harder than ever. Over a third of our hospitals no longer available. Our doctors no longer covered. Fewer choices, longer drives. No state has been harder hit than us. And even after watching it impact New Hampshire, Congresswoman Ann Custer still supports it. Call Ann Custer. Tell her Obamacare isn't working for New Hampshire. Congress needs to end wasteful government spending, like the $787 billion of taxpayer money thrown away in the 2009 stimulus package. 
It may not have done you any good, but U.S. Senator Gene Shaheen's business interest made out to the tune of $78,000. No wonder she doesn't want to talk about it whenever the subject pops up. Call Senator Shaheen and tell her you're tired of wasteful government spending. Okay, Mike. Sorry. No, that's that's fine. And uh, you know, so the uh, Consumer Finance Protection Board, which, by the way, Elizabeth Warren in her speech to Nutroots claimed was her idea, and she harangued legislators until it happened, happens to be one of the premier parts of the Dodd Frank, uh, mm -hmm. the bill that Scott Brown was so happy to sign into law because. Just like that corrupt company that he signed on with, he didn't really read the details. Correct. So, yeah, that's kind of where we are. I mean, really, where we are. And, and I just, you know, people don't see it yet because, you know, nobody, they're not into this politics like we are. And it's, sometimes it's so hard to explain it to them, you know. And they, they're, they're happy to, to cheerlead when somebody says, oh, take all that money from business. And you have to say to yourself, well, who pays you? You know, where do you get your money from? What if it was you? I mean, where do you think this $17 trillion is going to come from? There isn't enough money in the company if you sold all the rich people out to pay for it. And, and, Six and, months, that's it. And then, and then what happens? There's no businesses, there's no money, there's no investment, there's nothing but the government, which relies on you to pay them. So where do you think they're going to get that money from? They're going to take it right. from you. Well, and they're taking it from you and invisibly as well, of course, in inflation. Absolutely. And, you know, the inflation continues. The reason why foodstuffs are now shooting up in price here, and in fact they've been shooting up in price around the world for the last 12 or 14 years, due to us and our dollar and our corn for ethanol and all the other programs that we do-gooders have, uh, you know, first we starved the Mexicans and the Egyptians, now we're beginning to starve our own people. Maybe it doesn't quite look like that yet, but... You know, the price of gasoline, the price of heating, the price of electricity, the price of foodstuffs, bread, milk, meat. It's all going up. It's all going up dramatically, and it's going up dramatically because basically government is on the one hand strangling businesses and is on the other hand inflating the currency. Anybody who has to uh, grocery shop on a weekly or twice monthly basis will tell you that the things that they used to buy cost twice as much and come in smaller packages now. The uh, milk and bread have been probably subsidized or the stores are taking a hit on milk and bread to get people in to buy the other stuff because milk hasn't gone up. Milk is subsidized, but bread, I don't know about. Anyway, it seems like they're keeping those prices lower because uh, they haven't changed much in the last couple of years. But like a box of cereal, I buy a lot of cereal. I got like a boys to big, they eat cereal. And that's gone up from, you know, it used to be on sale for $2 a box, and now you're lucky to get it on sale for three fifty for a smaller box. Well, so, here, here's the other thing. I watch Hamburg prices. And price oh of Hamburg, gosh. you know, I shop at Shaw's. And they well, have a couple of, well, they're. You have no choice, I know. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you. The regular price now is about four or five dollars a pound, and the fancy brand of, you know, free ranging, no antibiotic, organic beef. I kid you not, eight dollars and ninety nine cents a pound. Eight ninety nine for ninety percent fat free hamburger. Come on, what the heck is going on? Same thing with and, fish. And you know, it's chicken's a, tough too. Yeah, well, actually, chicken's been relatively low. It's still and up. But it's, I mean, it is up, but it's it's lesser by comparison. And you know, I, 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 it. The longer I do this political blogging, the more cynical I get, and the more apt I'm willing to believe, especially over the last six years, stuff that I used to think pure conspiracy theory. I keep thinking, it's not. You know, they they all want us to go to renewable energy. So what do they do? They are killing off the coal company. Uh, I mean, the coal industry, they're closing down, making sure that the coal generating plants for electricity are being shuttered. The Sierra Club has a stat, 157 down, 351 to go. Posted that up last night. You know, they've got beyond coal, beyond oil, beyond gas. They think just solar and wind is going to make it all, folks. Yeah, beyond charging your car that you were forced to buy yeah. with a federal subsidy. Yeah, well, which, is, which got, has got to get electricity. So when you start to get blackouts, your car doesn't get charged, and even the greenies can't go anywhere. <laughs> well, here's the thing, Mike. Um, the ISO is already warning 
that here in the New England area, we are so close, razor thin on the safety margins of electrical generation and supply. They're predicting if we have another winter that is as cold as last year. Colder. They're ex well, that's what Weather Bell is saying. They're expecting rolling blackouts and brownouts. Which are awesome in the middle of a New England winter. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of people don't have secondary heat sources. Yeah, I'm lucky that I do. And, and I can take care. I'm pretty much self-sufficient for, for that kind of thing and some power for a limited amount of time. I have a generator and I have a fireplace, but that, you know. Yeah. You still have to put gas in the generator. Yeah. But yeah, you're still gonna yeah you're still gonna put gas in the generator or buy propane for the slightly bigger generator that I have, and you've got to buy the wood, or you've got to have enough of the supply and be you, willing to. You can chainsaw come to shopping. Steve's house and cut up the trees that are down in his yard. Uh, you know, I might just I'll have to buy a chainsaw, but it might still be worth it. There's plenty out there. I've got about twenty trees just laying in the woods in my yard, waiting to be cut up. Again, Chris Roberts said the the role of government is to legislate behavior, and certainly. The environmentalists in Obama's administration are, and, and everybody else are basically saying, we know we have a plan for how you should live. Trust us, you'll like it. And I'm saying, this is not the mark of a free country. And yet they're hell-bent on telling us how better to organize our lives. And I keep seeing this stuff. Well, we're now seeing within the FDA, they're redoing their quote-unquote suggested food stuff. And they're already saying, we need to push people to go vegan, mostly because it'll help the globe, it'll help global warming. So as the price of meat goes up, if it gets to a certain point, people will have to. They're not going to be given a choice. Choice and freedom are being taken away. Is that really what the United States was founded on? The idea that government should say, here, here's the food that we will allow you to eat. Well, why not? With the cafe standards, they're saying, here's the cars that the manufacturers only will be able to generate or manufacture because we've made the regulation so on onerous. Don't worry, you'll love your smart car with your six member of family. Oh no, you won't be able to have six kids in your family. Nope. And, you know, they just don't well, see. Oh, but that's, uh, but that's okay because they won't stop the Muslims from having six kids, so we'll get overrun. Actually, you could get you could get six uh, illegal immigrant kids. I hear there's plenty of them laying around that you could just pick up and bring into your house. Oh, please, don't get me started. You know, <laughs> I, I like George Will. I think he's an amazingly smart person. I'm glad to see that he's on Fox News rather than only seeing him on ABC's uh, This Week every Sunday morning. But I'll tell you, when he ever said, look at all the kids coming over. We've got, you know, how many counties in the U.S.? That's only 30 kids per county. You can't say we can't assimilate them. I'm sorry. Well, how many are you putting up in your house, George? Yeah, and let's, let's put that in perspective, folks. Are those kids going to uh, build their own houses and their own schools? Those counties that have only got 30 kids on, uh, because they're sparsely populated and there's not many families and not many houses there. So you bring a bunch of extra kids in and uh, you, you're still going to cram those into a small number of houses at a very high percentage. That's, that just doesn't work. And, and, and by the way, the, the direction I was going wasn't just uh, you know, all this uh, government uh, blanket over everything that we're trying to do. It's the socialist populism. The thing that scares me the most is the lioness in the long grass. I refer to Laya Wather, the lady that gave that speech at Nutroots. Mm -hmm. Red alert, Liz Warren would be a bigger disaster than Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Much and, she's a better, and she's a better speaker. <laughs> yeah, she, well, that's becoming rather clear after the last couple of clunkers he's given this past week. Yeah. Uh, um, let me be clear. Well, he's just, he's just, uh, he's already done. He gave up. He's finished. He's just, he shows up when they need him, they need him to, like, put his thumbprint on something or, well, or, the, or the sign problem, a piece of paper. He just, he's just golfing and vacationing. And the, the problem you know, that Fundraising, like, fundraising, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Hold on, Mike. The, the problem is, is that from a progressive standpoint, he is as successful as FDR and Woodrow Wilson and LBJ. Look at the changes that he has wrought upon our economic system with a massive amount of regulation, which is what the progressive state is all about. He's put, regardless of all the Democrats that he sacrificed 
during his first two years. Look at the, the he, they've got the last linchpin of being able to do population control with Obamacare. You now have to go to government to get anything. If you want a change in the regulations, you have to beseech not your not your doctor who you could change, not your insurance company that you could get a different one, but how often can you get a new federal government? You're stuck, and that's the yeah, way progressives yeah. want it. We, we have to reverse direction completely and make the states strong enough that we can shrink the federal government. It's, it's, it's the only way it's going to work. The only al other alternative is the armed revolution that starts when they come for us, and we don't want to be there. That's well, not how, how we want it to go. Maybe I'm ge getting into a bad mood the longer I'm sitting here in the uh, Granite Rock Liberty studio, but, you know, how often has it been and for how long has it been that the federal government has been bribing the states with money. The favorite example I have is seatbelts, where they offered the state of New Hampshire $3.62 per driver to basically force seatbelt usage here in the state. Yeah, our money. Yeah, our money to do, uh, f frankly, what I think any really good person uh, should do be doing anyways. But progressives, look at the other way. Look at the people who have to help you if you get into an accident. Look at the burden you're putting on them to see you mangled and everything else. It's like, what the heck are you talking about? They're going to show up for the accident our, anyway. One of our former Republican uh, progressives out of Belknap County, Doc Pilliard, he and I used to have grand discussions. Are you telling this. me that, that if you're wearing a seatbelt and you're in a horrible accident, the same people aren't going to show up? Or without, the, without it. But they're going to show up anyway. Time, I mean, it goes back to what you say, Steve. We'll keep the money here in the first place, and we wouldn't have such a, an overly large federal government that's making the states merely uh, federal outposts. Right, but, but how many Republicans are taking the money? Look what the rogue Republicans did here in New Hampshire. New Hampshire State Senators Chuck Morse, Jeff Bradley, Nancy Stiles, Bob O'Dell, 300 oh. <laughs> 300 odd million dollars to implement Obama's Obamacare's Medicaid expansion. Governor Kasich, Kasich, where you're at right now, of Ohio, welcome the Obamacare money into, um, I hear music, uh, into Ohio so that he could get more money for his budget, making him more indebted to the federal government. Yeah, with Republicans like these, who needs Democrats? Right, and that's the first segment of Grog Talk. I'm Steve McDonald, Skip Murphy. Mike is in Ohio. We are going to have Emily Sandblade on next to talk about education standards in Manchester. So stay tuned for that, and, uh, you know, stay tuned for everything else, because, hey, it's awesome, right? <laughs> that's Grog Talk. We will be back in about two and a half minutes. Stay tuned. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Jeb Bradley has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along voting like a liberal Democrat. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now, Senator Bradley is leading the charge to try and pass a Senate bill to prevent us from criticizing his vote. Call Senator Bradley at 603-569-4208 and tell him that we're on to his wolf in sheep's clothing routine. Tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, 
the right to know law. And now, at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out? CNHT.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. You're listening to Grok Talk. Grok Talk. Welcome back to Grok Talk, segment 2, August 9th, 2014. I am here with Skip Murphy. I am Steve McDonald. Mike Rogers is calling online from Ohio, and our guest is on the line as well, and we'll be bringing her on in a second. Just wanted to remind you to visit us at granitrock.com, and please go to cnht.org to see what they do. We are available, this podcast, the video, all over. Go to granitrock.com, see all the awesome places where you can check us out and listen to our great guests. Speaking of which, our next guest is Emily Samblade, New Hampshire State Rep from Hillsborough, 18, and she is here to talk to us, I believe, about education standards. Emily, how are you doing today? Hi there. I'm here to talk about the Manchester Academic Standards, which are a rework, uh, a bare rework of Common Core, which the Manchester School Board is going to vote on Monday night. Great. Well, I hear that this has been happening all over where places first adopt Common Core and then they either reject it outright because of the outcry when they when people find out this has never been used before, hasn't been tested, hasn't been vetted, or like uh, you're finding out in Manchester, they are kind of rewriting the around the edges, tinkering it with a little bit, but basically it's still Common Core, a rose by any other name. Uh, I wouldn't call it a rose. But <laughs> the thorns, okay. Idea. You, you can say fact, steaming turd if you want. We, we we don't have to worry about the FCC. So, Okay. In fact, one of the interesting things uh, about the current standards is it looks like 81% of Common Core got recycled without any modification at all, and then a fair amount of the re- remainder was just re- rewritten to be kinder and gentler uh, rather than the standard Common Core. There's a little bit of addition in a few places, but mostly it's the same old stuff. So you guys are um, calling and leafleting and doing all kinds of stuff now. Uh, there's, um, there's we're leafleting the neighborhoods like crazy around here right now. We're uh, distributing about seven thousand flyers uh, over the, over about a ten day period all through Manchester. Wow! I yes, would say we that's organized grassroots. the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. Now there's some background to this. Originally. Um, I think was it a few months back the board had had a very raucous discussion with a lot of people showing up about changing the standards and they had said that they were weren't going to do common core. Is that correct? Yes, that's what they said. In fact, Mayor Gass said that they would develop new standards that they would be the envy of every school system in the state because they'd be the best in the state. And the reality is is according to both Tom Raffio and Bill Duncan, the recently appointed uh, member of the Board of Education, Tom Raffio is the head of the Board of Education, uh, the Manchester Academic Standards essentially are common core. So they're coming to the same conclusion that we are when we look at it. So that really doesn't help uh, the, the Manchester School Board very much when the outside quote-unquote higher level Board of Education says, you still got the same crap. Well, they, they realize that they've got the same, same uh, garbage out there, but the problem is, and they realize that, so what they've done is they set it to where they release the standards to the public right in the middle of summer when all the parents are on vacation and, P, and the kids are out of school and nobody's watching what the school board's doing. And then the school board claimed that, well, they didn't have very many people show up to complain, so therefore it must be okay. Well, we're fixing that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm beginning to see a, a nasty pattern because coming from Guilford, we, we are having uh, some issues with the board where they've just basically said, well, during public input, we'll listen, but there's no interaction. There's no accountability. They even codified it where, if it, you know, we're coming from the uh, school board where the person was arrested for trying to confront the school board for pornographic materials being presented in a freshman class. Oh, and yes, I met that gentleman, B- and Billy I, I think he's got a lot of courage. He, he does. And, uh, you know, the month afterwards, they codified a brand-new administrative uh, regulation that said a parent who is disgusted with the material can go see the principal, but that does not mean that they get to address the school board. So here we see elected officials saying we are not going to deign to 
talk to those that elected us. In other words, making themselves un basically unaccountable. And there's another school board that I haven't uh, posted up yet that's basically said the same thing. We'll give you public input at the end of our uh, meetings, but we're not going to talk back. You know, we'll listen, and that's about it. And I'm seeing this over and over and over again. And you do see that the school boards as a whole, through the state-level school boards, are starting to say, we're going to ramrod through anything we want, regardless of what the parents want. And you're basically telling us the same thing for Manchester, that yes. the school board is basically saying, we're going to make our decision regardless, and we'll put up any flimsy excuse that we can to ram it through. Yes, Mike? Hey, yeah. Uh, the shorter version of that is your leaders shall not be questioned. You shall not ask questions of your, state, of your uh, Congress, congressional reps. They won't hold meetings. You shall not ask questions of Scott Brown. He's already got his Senate club membership and he isn't going to give it up and so on and so forth. So, Emily, how do you, how do you respond to that? Is it, is it well, a case of I mean, just these standards or is it a case of um, basically ever-threatening school boards and Manchester is being one of them? I think you have to pretty much threaten the school boards. And the only thing, speaking as a politician myself, the only thing that politicians consistently understand is pain. And if you threaten their reelection, they sit up and take notice. And what we're doing right now is we're threatening to throw a lot of them out. Well, and I think that's a good thing. Now, the, the question would be, Manchester has to, and any town, has to spend lots of money in implementing Common Core. And, you know, and I'm looking at this from the Guilford standpoint. They just put in a whole bunch of standards a couple of years ago, retrained, quote, unquote, all their highly qualified teachers and put in all this new curriculum. Now they're going to throw it out, retrain the teachers, bring in all this other material. And we keep seeing instances of what the Common Core material is. And you're going, what? Those of us who grew up in the 50s and 60s with good grade schools and junior high schools and high schools are going, what are they saying about the Constitution? What are they saying about our history? How are they trying to do math? You know, I, I'm just a, a software engineer. I made it through multivariate calculus, but you're a physicist, correct? Yes, I am. So you're heavy into the math, and you must be just dying when you see some of these math examples that keep floating up. Well, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a situation where we're going to have very few kids who are qualified to go pursue STEM careers successfully. And what we see is, is the kids that only finish Algebra two only have a 2% chance of making it through a STEM program if they even start one at all. And that's a very serious problem because in this country we depend very, very heavily on our technology to sustain our way of life. Hey, Emily. And we're already losing that. A Emily, for our readers and listeners who may not have gotten what we've written before, explain STEM. Oh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers. In other words, it's the heavy thinker kind of stuff. Uh, it's math heavy, pretty analytical. Mike? Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, is, yeah that is why uh, you know, the Asian students and the Indian imports are so prized by businesses, because we're already succeeding in dumbing down our own kids to the point where they're not employable in the engines that drive America's prosperity. Well, that's going to become uh, not so doable in the future because there's a couple of things that are happening. One is, is that the number of foreign students has fallen off um, somewhat because of uh, uh, 2000, the, the, the World Trade Center attacks. And what has happened is the State Department has really tightened up who can get a student visa. So more students are, are going to European schools and other schools around the world rather than come to American schools because of the difficulty of getting into the United States to study. They should just cross the border from Mexico. <laughs> well, unfortunately, most of the ones crossing the border from Mexico are not STEM candidates. No, they're not. But... And that's a problem. So the other, the other major factor that's going on is we about half of our technical students in the United States in the colleges are foreign students, which I think is a crying shame. It doesn't say much for American students right now. And the problem is, is that the foreign co uh, countries are developing much faster than they used to. The, the rate of improvement is, is phenomenal right now. And a lot of those students who used to stay in the U.S. and go to work for U.S. companies and contribute to the U.S. economy are now returning home. So we can't count on those foreign students to, to man our power plants or run our computer companies or 
do whatever we need to have in order to continue to sustain our standard of living. So we have to. This is absolutely critical. We absolutely have to educate our kids well in mathematics, and Common Core is going in the completely wrong direction for that. And if we don't fix this right away within 20 to 30 years, we're going to be seeing the U.S. become a third world country. Well, isn't that so? Uh, been making this case for probably 40 or 50 years that we have to better educate our kids because they're not quite keeping up with the best nations around the world, except they're doing it through federal standards, federal coercion, and a complete uh, dumbing down of the standards. Uh, well, we it's just not only complete the... dumbing down, but it's totally untested. And, and what's worse is, is that they're imposing it on everybody all at once. And as an engineer, I'm sure you can understand that if you if you deploy a system without testing and you deploy it to everybody at once, it's just a total recipe for failure. I mean, it, it's just it's just a disaster in the making. You know, and, and I keep looking because I'm managing two software slow rollouts at the moment to prevent exactly that from happening. <laughs> yeah, and you roll out gradually. The other issue here is, is that we know that the best information that can be acquired. Uh, for how to do things is always local. And if you're going to have something that's federally uh, centered, you're basically getting rid of the local component, you're getting rid of local information, and you're doing a one-size-fits-all. And we know that monocultures, whether they're in biology or society or engineering or wherever, monocultures don't work. And the real problem with Common Core is it's a monoculture. And once it, Common Core is imposed, if it, if it gets imposed on the whole country, once it's imposed, there's going to be absolutely no incentive out there to improve it or make it better. Well, here's another part of the problem that isn't being talked about, but one of the leading proponents of Common Core is the guy who heads up the college board, which does the, uh, the SATs and the LSATs and, and mm -hmm. ACT and all the other stuff, and they are incorporating that information into the tests. So now you are cutting off all the alternatives, the charter schools, the private schools, the online schools, the homeschoolers, because it, it, unless the college bubble bursts like uh, people like Glenn Reynolds of Instapundit have been predicting for a while, and we're starting to see that now, uh, there is only one test. And I keep looking at, you know, for us as political uh, folks and news junkies, I'm looking at some of the history and the social science, and, and it's it's the leftist type crap that always points out to be the blame America first. They don't say the true history. They just say the wrongs of America along history. They don't go into the philosophy. They don't go into the primary material. You know, the reading is being taught from informational, factual type stuff, not the great literature that teaches about the world as we live it. Um, mm -hmm. And you go, how? Why are we shortchanging our kids this way? Well, I ask that frequently. Uh, I, I, I was privileged to have a very good education, and um, there is nothing like an excellent education where you're actually taught real thinking, real critical thinking, to um, survive in the world. And what we're doing is we're crippling our children's minds. We're crippling their capability to survive in the future because they don't understand where they've come from. They don't understand the history of the society they're in. They don't understand the basic premises. Emily, we're going to take a quick break. Stay on the line, and we'll be right back after this. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Jeb Bradley has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along, voting like a liberal Democrat. <laughs> and oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now, Senator Bradley is leading the charge to try and pass a Senate bill to prevent us from criticizing his vote. Call Senator Bradley at 603-569-4208 and tell him that we're on to his wolf in sheep's clothing routine. <laughs> tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. We are struggling. 
Rising health care costs are part of the problem. Senator Jean Shaheen helped create this mess we're in. As a state senator, her bill chased 21 insurers out of our state. It reduced our choices, raised prices for New Hampshire families, and when Jean Shaheen supported Obamacare, it limited access to 10 of our 26 hospitals, reducing our choices again. Tell Jean Shaheen she's made health care worse. We are back. Mike is back. I guess we lost Mike and we didn't know it. This is Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com on the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, coming to you pretty much every Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m. Uh, from Concord, New Hampshire. Next week, we will be broadcasting live from the Londonderry Fish and Game Club. Uh, congressional, uh, congressional, gubernatorial, gubernatorial candidate, I hate that word, gubernatorial candidate Andrew Hemingway is having a shoot. And it is Londonderry Fish and Game, and we will be there broadcasting the program. I don't know if we'll be on the same hours, because his event starts at 11. Is that correct? Something like that. Yeah, but we'll, we'll be there. I'll be there early. You'll be there early, and we'll see. Uh, I'm going to try to be there. It's my birthday next weekend. Yeah, we'll see. I might show up. Anyway, back to our conversation. And I'll, and I'll, bring the, I'll bring the Wi-Fi, and we'll try and get it up speed to stream the program. Yes, we had a little bit of difficulty last time, but we shall, we shall endeavor to try again. Okay, so... Anyway, back to the conversation. Emily, you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay. So we were talking about uh, you know, Common Core, Common Core teachings, and hamstringing our students. And frankly, it gives me a rather dismal feeling of uh, going forward. Now, that may make me eminently employable for the rest of my life if I so choose. And given the way that Social Security is going, that may have to be it. We may have seen the golden age of retirement pass into the midst of history here in the United States. Um, but that's okay. I enjoy what I do. I get to help people. I get to solve problems. I get to work with computers and still do some software engineering on the side and all that other stuff. But... Um, it doesn't say very good things. And, you know, one of the things I want to ask you, we see this alien, uh, the illegal alien kid invasion, where most of them are teenagers, most of them coming up from Central America. Very few of them are even literate in their own languages. Um, we're, what kind of effect is this going to be with uh, on the poor districts that get all these kids? We see that uh, the, we uh, the Obama weaponized administration is certainly dumping on Arizona. We see that Lynn, Massachusetts is already crying out, stop, we can't take anymore. You're driving us into financial ruin. What kind of, uh, and Manchester has a big refugee problem because oh, all yeah. of these NGOs who think they're doing so much nice stuff. <clears throat> they're getting paid by the head. Yeah, they're getting paid by the head to dump these people in. Federal government pays for eight months. And then it's the local governments that now have to not use money that they could be using to educating students, but paying for people who are just, they're bewildered about being here in America and you know, take it from there. Well, in Manchester, as of a couple of years ago, we already had a very significant problem because we had English uh, taught as a second language to uh, speakers of 80 different languages, and we had to employ teachers of those 80 different languages. And teachers who are bilingual, of course, command a higher pay rate than those who aren't. And so as a result, we spent uh, a couple of years ago, we were spending $8 million a year just on educating uh, students who didn't speak English as a first language. Wow. Yeah, and that's pretty significant, and I expect that that will rise significantly, of course. Uh, Manchester looks like it's going to be the dumping ground for, for more of these children, and uh, we're going to get stuck with the bill. Well, I know that uh, with the brouhaha the last week, and the, especially the week and the week before that, in Dover where 300 Congolese refugees were supposed to be put into uh, you know, housing there, and then over the next six years, some of them might become citizens, and then they've got the right of chain migration, and so up to 3,000, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to come into a small town of 30,000, and I talked with the uh, mayor for quite some time, and she was beside herself, we can't afford this, even just from a school system standpoint, but how are we going to take care of these people after these NGOs under the guise of we're caring for these people, and they dump them, walk away, and expect the local communities. This is almost a forced, I almost want to say, 
a, a, a challenge to the you Third Amendment, I mean the Third Bill of Rights of that pertain to the quartering of soldiers in the House. You know, well, instead of soldiers, these are you're, you're being forced to take care of people that aren't yours to begin with. Well, that's the problem with any system that rolls out the red carpet to any takers. Uh, you end up taking care of a lot of people because there's a tremendous incentive for people to take advantage of that. And, and we're seeing right now where President Obama, and I call it determined weakness, where I think he is trying to take us down as being the lone superpower. And I think that if this continues, especially on the southern border and bringing all these other places in, um, and with the general destruction of our educational system, we are going to be second world, if not third world. Uh, and I, and I, am, I may be called a nativist, Emily, but mm -hmm. you know something? I think that we became the greatest country in the world because of some basic principles, and now we're seeing those principles either being ignored or openly scoffed at. I tend to agree with you. Mike? Yeah, I, what I was going to say is, you know, the town should simply refuse to deal with these people. There's no reason to put them in the school if they're not citizens and residents. There's no reason to pay for those extra teachers, make the NGOs pay for those ex second language teachers. And when the, the money stops, the teachers stop. Let them learn the language the way everybody else learned it when they came here, which is by immersion. I don't expect the government to pay for me to learn Spanish if I travel in, in South America. Well, the problem is is that how many local communities do you know that are going to outright refuse to take care of the people that are put there, knowing that you've got somebody like an Eric Holder uh, at the DOJ willing to bring the legion of lawyers against you? Well, and that's the problem, is the Supreme Court has tended to rule in case after case that you have to take care of the illegals. Uh, you have to give them medical care, you have to give them education, you know, they get a lot of benefits even though, you know, they, they may be recently arrived and have never paid a dime in taxes. Uh, they have no, no investment in, in the United States. But this is just what it is. So what you're really doing is putting up a great big huge sign that says, here, come here and live for free. And that's really what it comes down to, and that's why we're seeing these hundreds of thousands of kids being shipped without their parents over the border. Yeah, and a perfect example of that, Emily, is Obama's Auntie Zatuni, who lived in, Bo in the Boston area for years, even though she was illegal. She was supposed to be deported, and I think uh, uh, because she was o Obama's half-aunt, something stepped in. But she lived on taxpayer expense for decades. And y you're right. These people who have not been invested, they've come here because they hear perhaps that they get stuff free. It used to be that the streets are paved with gold and opportunity was unlimited. Now it's a case of here's the government apartment, the government food, the government health care, the government transportation, the government education. Um, you, can get, you can live for free. How long can a country last with an outlook like that? Uh, until it's bankrupt, which is not that far off. Oh, well, when you, when, you, when you run out of producers, you have to borrow. When you run out of lenders, you have to print. We're already there. Yeah, the question is, is when you're 17 trillion in debt, more than 17 trillion in debt, and you're you're going into debt, you know, another uh, 1.8 trillion a year or so, um, you're going to run out of people who loan you money sooner or later. I mean, eventually your credit rating crashes. And the problem is, is I don't think that that point is that far off. I think it's a few years off at most. And frankly, it's really stupid to get into that kind of position. Look at the number of countries that are trying to de-dollarize and ask yourself how long be before uh, pushing on a piece of string becomes the literal problem. <laughs> I think it's already becoming a literal problem almost. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, we look at the Democrats who have always been known as the big spenders and Obama's determined weakness. But we also are starting to see signs that the Republicans in D.C. are no longer keeping the debt as their number one problem as far as at least campaign. They may campaign about it, but their actions, their legislation and their votes are saying, you know, with what they're doing lately, increase the debt. So the question becomes... When most people continue to vote their congressman and their senator back in year after year after year, where's the hope? 
Um, I'm not sure there is any. Uh, frankly, I don't see the political will in Washington to address the debt at all. And the very first thing that they should be doing is is living within their means, which means living within about 57% of the budget that they don't borrow. And that would be the very first start. And there is no political, I see almost no political will at all to go through that kind of cut. I see, I see politicians all up and down the line on both sides of the aisle, all lining up for, for federal handouts, for federal grants. And this whole school thing, you know, the, the whole Common Core thing, a lot of the reason it's going through is because of race to the top money. Yeah. It's, it's, it's heavily, it's heavily moni- uh, monetarily based. Emily, um, you have a, a, a lot of our listeners and readers are in Manchester. It's one of our largest single groups. Um, we're almost out of time, so what message would you give them real quick? And uh, if they need to contact you, how would they do that? Well, the message I'd like to give them is... Uh, uh, show up for the school board meeting on Monday night at 7 p.m. And even if you don't want to speak, and that's perfectly fine, just being there is enough to convince uh, the school board that their attempt to adopt Common Core is just completely out of line. If they want to contact me, they can contact me at Emily Sandblade, S A N D B L A D E, at gmail.com. Okay, and, and that's the Monday, August them, 11th, right? Monday, August okay, 11th, right, and, and that's going to be at City Hall. Okay, and if they want to call me, I'm, I'll be happy to talk to them. My phone number is 845-3228. All right, Emily, thank you. And if you spell it out on the phone, it spells vile cat. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody does that. That's good. I like that. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us today. And thank you very much. Okay. We'd, we'd love to have you in studio at some point soon. Yep. We'll have you back on, to come. on something else. All right. Uh, have a good okay. weekend. You too. All right. We'll thank see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. I have to, to bow, guys. Uh, I have arrived at the memorial service for which I came to Ohio. All right, Mike, you have a great day. We're going to move on to our next segment in a, uh, about a minute or two uh, with Susan Olson. Bye. Say goodbye to Mike. We're off the phones. Uh, Susan Olson's next. We're gonna. Ha- she's gonna call us, so she may call in while we've already started the segment. Whatever that means that we works. gotta watch Ed, huh? And we gotta watch Ed. Make the sure we Ed Lark and the So, um, yeah, that's our thing. Uh, there's our music. We've come to the end of another segment. So, everybody in Manchester, you listen, you read, go to the school board meeting Monday, the 11th, and. Uh, Get your information from Emily. You can go everywhere. I mean, this subject, everybody's really, really fired up about this thing. And they want to, you know, go down there and say, look, this is, these aren't the standards we're looking for. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. These uh, are not the droids we're looking for. These are not the droids we're looking for. All right. This is... Although it will create droids. This is you. <laughs> well, zombies. This is Grok Talk brought to you by GraniteRock.com the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We will be back in just a few minutes with Susan Olson to talk about the pistol revolver license application changes in New Hampshire. We'll be right back. Senator Jean Shaheen said, if you like your current health plan, you can keep it. That's not true, Senator. 22,000 New Hampshire citizens have been kicked off their insurance plans. Hospitals in Rochester, Concord, and Portsmouth, they aren't allowed to provide care under the exchange. Senator, you were wrong in your comments. You should apologize for your misleading remarks. I'm calling Senator Shaheen at 750-3004 and telling her I want my doctor back. You should too. Paid for by saberpack.org, not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Dave Booten has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along voting like a liberal Democrat. He voted to raise your gas tax by another 23%. Taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now 
the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Putin's vote? Call Senator Putin at 603-203-5391 and tell him that we're on to his wolf and sheep's clothing routine. <laughs> tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Few things are as important as finding the right doctor. And under Obamacare, that's harder than ever. Over a third of our hospitals no longer available. Our doctors no longer covered. Fewer choices, longer drives. No state has been harder hit than us. And even after watching it impact New Hampshire, Congresswoman Ann Custer still supports it. Call Ann Custer. Tell her Obamacare isn't working for New Hampshire. Welcome back to Grot Talk. Hawaii style. Hawaii 50 style. If there's anything left of Hawaii. Uh, after all the hurricanes, yes. Yes. Well, hey, that's weather that happens. Well, that's all right. Weather, Hawaii, the wolf whistle. You know, I have to love that commercial that Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire did against Dave Boone. It really was just splendiferous. That, that wolf whistle is just perfect. Yeah. What do you it's think, howling, Susan? Howling. Do you agree? I love it. You know. <laughs> We'd like to welcome Susan Olson to the program. Yet another grokster. Yet another grokster. Political activist. Yep. Extraordinaire. Yes. Working, working, working right now to help elect good conservatives in New Hampshire. Yes. The lady Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a break from the phone bank this morning um, on behalf of Andrew Hemingway and Jane Cormier. Oh, so... Okay. Got a whole crew down here this morning. Yeah, Excellent. when we came in, we had lots of stuff with her name on it spread all over our what we thought was our exclusive table. <laughs> and all of our wires are all over the place. It's like, yow. There are thousands of pages of things with the words Jane Cormier on the top. Isn't it fun? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I, got, I got that beeping in, so just ignore that. It's, okay. a, it's a busy, busy morning. It, it, it so, certainly so is. So thanks for having me on. Um, I wish I could be in the studio, but uh, this is almost as good. You're working. You're working. It's good. So uh, you wrote a really awesome post this week. Thank um, you. And uh, and it was, its awesomeness wasn't just in the content and the fact that you caught something that that the bureaucrats in Concord thought they had snuck by, and which mm -hmm. they kind of had till you caught it. But uh, you, you, you did the legwork, you went down and you talked to the right people, and then you reported that. And uh, why don't you give us a synopsis? Well, um, as, as just a little background, you guys already know that I'm a, I'm a pretty uh, a vocal uh, defender of our uh, natural rights of uh, self-defense as codified by... Um, um, the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution. And we, we were witnessing in the last legislature attempts to um, restrict those rights by uh, adding bits and pieces to background checks. And you know that there's a federal form called 4473 that you have to go, when you go to buy a, a firearm that, say, uh, Riley's, which is one of my favorite um, sports shops, you have to fill this format and it asks you a series of questions that are required by federal law to determine whether or not you are what is considered by federal law a prohibited person. For example, um, you're a convicted felon, or you've renounced your American citizenship, or you've been adjudicated um, by a court of law as uh, being. Uh, incapable of managing their own affairs is, uh, I think the, it's a really tacky phrase, but a mental incompetent. Um, so there are a number of questions that you are asked, and if you answer any of them in the affirmative, then most likely you will be denied the right to purchase a firearm. Now, in the state of New Hampshire, uh, it is what's called a point of contact state, where pistols, um, you can uh, go through the uh, uh, first level here at the uh, Department of Safety for that application. But in order to carry that pistol out of your house uh, on
on your person or in your vehicle and have that uh, firearm loaded, you must be in possession of a pistol-slash-revolver license. It's not a concealed carry uh, permit. It is a license to um, take a pistol that you own outside of your house. Now, um, on the Department of Safety website, you can ostensibly download such an application. And there's a brand new one that was put up on their website. It's unclear when. But this particular pistol revolver license application has been modified to include a new question. And this is what sort of cooked my carrots. It included a question, and if I may, let me put on my reading glasses and read it to you. It says, quote, has any state or federal agency or licensing authority ever claimed that you are prohibited by law or regulation from possessing a firearm? There you go. Most people would go, no, which which cannot be a correct answer unless you know for certain that every state or federal agency or licensing authority has not made such a claim. Well, that's impossible. So you're going, wait a minute. How can anyone answer this question? Well, you cannot, and by default, you are unable to apply for a pistol or revolver license. It's kind of backdoor... um, gun control. Now, do I think this is nefarious? Do I think this is a coincidence? Do I think this is just, oh, golly gee whiz, updating the forms? No. No. Anyone who is um, moderately familiar with the New Hampshire uh, laws and rules understands a process under which an agency or department must go under RSA 541A, Administrative Rulemaking. You've all seen pieces of legislation or a bill even that says, the commissioner shall make rules. So a law gets passed, gets signed, and then it goes back to the agency or department to make up the rules that uh, allow that law to be implemented. Well, um, since... This was a material change to a department form. The first place I went was the Department of Administrative Rules. Uh, Some nice folks over in the State House Annex across from the the State Capitol, second floor. And I went over there with this form and I said, hey guys, uh, I would like to get the the, uh, the rulemaking background on this particular change to the form because I can't find anything. Uh, Susan, would, huh? yeah. Susan, I have uh, pulled up your post, and if people are watching on the live stream or later on during the recording, I have isolated that question on your blog post, and it will be, it's, it's on right now on the live stream. And, okay. Uh, so people will now know what the, you're talking about. i got to get that mm-hmm. other screen in here. Mm. So please consider, continue, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. So um, as, it, as it would have it, this was this past Monday morning, bright and early, um, their computer system was down. And um, the the lovely ladies that worked there said, oh, you know, the system's down and we can't really get that for you. And I said, well, you know, um, maybe maybe we can look around. Well, the head of uh, administrative rulemaking is a, is a fellow named Scott Eaton. He's an attorney. Scott's been there, gosh, I have no idea how long, but if anybody knows what's going on in rulemaking, it's attorney Scott Eaton. And he was nice enough to come out and and visit with me, and I brought this to his attention, and he says, huh, he says, set more up, you know, I could answer that question for you um, in a few seconds. Well, systems weren't up, systems weren't up. And he says, well, hang on. Um, We looked up the relevant uh, RSA, which is uh, 159, uh, 4 through 6, Um. And he was pulling out some files. Well, as it turns out, there are um, administrative rulemaking uh, proceedings in their office 
for the non-resident pistol revolver application. And he's going, well, here's this. I said, no, no, that's for a non-resident. I said, what I'm concerned about is the resident form. Well, son of a gun, there was nothing he could find anywhere that uh, dealt with the resident application, which means there's been no rulemaking. There's been no submission to administrative rules proposing changes anywhere. He says, but, he says, again, Susan, if the system were up, I could, I could get on there, I could query it, and I could pull up everything that's happened. He says, but I don't. He said, so, if I were you, I would suggest you go over to the Department of Safety, and maybe they can help you out. And I went, that's a good idea. So I get in my little car, and I head on over to um, uh, off Loudon Road. Is that Loudon Road? Whatever it is. Um, and go on to the main campus of the, of the state offices, and I go to the Department of Safety. And go down to the little desk that says, here's, here's where you get your forms. And I said, hey, can you tell me what happened here? And the lady said, uh, nope, uh, but you can talk to the sergeant. And I said, well, I'd like to talk to the sergeant. Well, the sergeant isn't here. And I'm not sure what he's going to be here. So I said, okay. So I screwed up to um, the second or third floor, maybe third floor, to the commissioner's office. And I go over and I ring the doorbell. And um, they were nice enough. Um, I asked to see Commissioner Sweeney, Earl Sweeney, uh, who who knows me. And uh, they were nice enough to let me in. And I was advised he had 15 minutes before staff meeting, but he'd sit down and chat with me. So I showed him this, and I said, you know, what you talking about, Willis, on this floor? <laughs> And he says, oh, well, you know, states change their forms and this and that. I said, yeah, I, 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 yeah, but this question is unanswerable. And I said, let me tell you, aside from the fact that it's unanswerable, that it will, in fact, put me out of business as a pistol instructor, because I would not be able to have a student uh, applying for a class answer this question. I said, so, you know, if it's your intent to put me out of business, you know, I have a problem with that. But more importantly, no one can honestly answer that question and therefore cannot apply for a, for a license. Wouldn't it be perjury if they if they did answer it and they were wrong? Well, it's, it's, it's unclear mm-hmm. because on, on the federal form, on the 4473 or previous iterations of the state form, if you lie, then, then that's, a, that's a no-no. But this is not a question of lying. Mm-hmm. This is any, any state, small s, or federal agency, or licensing authority. Is that Hawaii? Is that Kansas? Is that Guam? Um, or licensing authority? Is this, you know, the, 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 the plumber's licensing, or realtor's licensing, or... There's no definitions to which you can turn to say, oh, okay, it's only these guys. No, it doesn't say that anywhere. So there's no way to answer this question. And no limiting authority. or principle. And no limiting authority, yeah. That's so he's fantastic. Like, Isn't that great? I, you know, these are some smart guys. Mm. And I said, well, gee whiz, uh, Commissioner. I said, you know, this is really problematic. He says, well, Susan... He says, you know, I think maybe, maybe uh, I, I understand some of your concern here. But let me have your phone number and your email, and I'll look into this, and I'll get back to you this week. Okay. Well, guess what, boys? It didn't get back to you? It didn't get back to me, but um, apparently it got back to Sam Cohen at Program New Hampshire. <laughs> you want to... Huh? You want to hold that thought while we go to a break, and then we can talk about this article, because I think I know where we're going to. Oh, boy. Okie dokie. Stay there. We'll be right back. Congress needs to end wasteful government spending, like the $787 billion of taxpayer money thrown away in the 2009 stimulus package. It may not have done you any good, but U.S. Senator Gene Shaheen's business interest made out to the tune of $78,000. No wonder she doesn't want to talk about it whenever the subject pops up. 
Call Senator Shaheen and tell her you're tired of wasteful government spending. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative. But State Senator Dave Booten has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in. But all along, voting like a liberal Democrat. He voted to raise your gas tax by another 23%. Taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Putin's vote? Call Senator Putin at 603-203-5391 and tell him that we're on to his wolf in sheep's clothing routine. <laughs> tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. We are back. We lost our air conditioning. We lost our... It's okay. We only have another 40 minutes or so. 45 minutes. So, uh, Susan, uh, Sam Cohn. Yeah. Let's Sam talk Cohn. about that on Grok Talk, brought to you by GranitGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. Please proceed. Well... Um, I didn't get an answer from, um, as I call him now, the Earl of Sweeney. Um, <laughs> but Sam Cohen, who's with Pro Gun New Hampshire, um, put something on their website saying, what if, he didn't say this, but the, the implication was, oh my God, these people are hysterical. Where is their tinfoil hat? Oh my God, there are two exclamation points, you know, that we're trying to be screwed out of our rights and that he was given assurances by um, the Earl of Sweeney that this is not a problem. You, don't, you know, there's, there's an adequate uh, space you can attach a piece of paper and say why you answer one way or the other. Well, no. Aside from the fact that the form was constructed and published extra-legally outside of jail car, um, being able to say, oh, golly gee whiz, I can explain this away, and, and wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I'm going to count on the Department of, of Safety um, to say, well, we didn't mean to be imprecise, but come on, come on. So I'm in a bit of a, of a, of a, a disagreement now with, uh, with not only the Earl of Sweeney, but Mr. Sam Cohen. Now, don't get me wrong, there's some, some nice people um, at Pro Gun New Hampshire, but as it turns out, the Earl of Sweeney is the senior advisor. Oh, to Oregon, New Hampshire. And they said incest isn't a good thing. No, <laughs> oh, perhaps. Here in politics, it's never a good thing. Well, let me, let me, I, I, I went a little um, uh, ahead of myself for just a moment. After I had visited with the Earl, I went back to jail car immediately and wanted to, to tell them what I had learned uh, about the form and the fact that I'd been given an assurance by the Earl that he was going to look into this and get back to me. Well, Mr. Eaton was not available. He was already tied up in another meeting. But another attorney there, uh, a, a very nice man named Michael Morrill, sat with me and said, um, you know, safety's been having some problems because one of their attorneys is retired and so on and so forth. And, and in fact, um, Scott Eaton called over there just as soon as I left to, to ask some questions. Now, in this meantime, Mr. Morrill uh, was able to pull together and, and provide me with the relevant uh, changes to administrative rulemaking that put any and all forms under, jurisdiction is not a good word, but under the uh, 541A rulemaking process. So for at least two years, and maybe the mem memo didn't get to safety, but at least two years, all forms have been subject to administrative rulemaking. So, um, I had other things to do and said, well, um, I'll let you know what I find out from the Earl and so on and so forth. And I went home and did some of my own research uh, online and, in fact, have requested and, and, and picking up Monday 20 years 
of administrative rulemaking history on the non-resident application. So the non-resident application is not as stringent as the resident. So, you know, I understand I was blonde when I was young, and I've tried to overcome a great deal of that. But I may just be confused. I think not. I'm sorry. I'm being a bit facetious. I don't think you're but I, I'm really, I'm really distressed about this, and, and if, in fact, the Department of Safety just thinks it can change these things and, and, and do what they want without having to answer to citizens, something's really wrong. Well, I think it's just one more example of what we see in D.C. comes back here to Concord, where I've been writing about this more and more. The, the rule of law is one of the pillars of our representative or constitutional republic, the other one being the right to private property. And without those two pillars, it is hard to have the kind of republic that we are supposed to have, which is to protect our rights and privileges. That is, according to the Declaration of Independence, the purpose of government, not to do anything else. It's not safety and security. It is not to legislate by legislate behavior. It is not to tell us how we should live or organize our society. It is to protect liberties. And what we're seeing right now is not just sloppiness by the legislative branch, which we are all aware of, especially that in D.C., which seems to be making itself into the having all of the command and performance of the Roman Senate in giving away its turf and constitutional powers. But we see the rise of the progressive administrative state, and I sound like a broken record all the time, every single day and week, but I'm trying to sound the alarm here. And now we're seeing it in here in Concord where a, a, a a basically a regulatory agency that has no other rulemaking authority in this matter, just deciding upon itself, like the EPA, like the DOJ, like the Department of Interior, like the DOT uh, in D.C. Oh, like I mean, uh, every the, single freaking administrative type right, deal. Right here in New Hampshire, the House and bureaucrats just tried to propose a real estate transfer tax rule change that they never brought up during the legislative session, that they knew was going to come up for renewal, and they never brought it up. And then they walked in to the committee with this, hey, we just want to change this, and of course it would create a new tax. I mean, I think these things are not just separate incidents. No, they're not. But you, know, you know what's what's really even, you know, when we were fighting all these bad gun bills in the legislature while it was still um, going on. Um, in January of this year, um, as part of my, my prep for a couple of hearings, I downloaded the state's pistol revolver license application to do a compare and contrast to the federal 4473 for a hearing for uh, House Bill 1589. But the form that was on the Department of Safety website on January um, 14th of 2014, and I have all this time and date stamped, so, you know, if they think they're going to waffle out of it, they're not. The form that was on their website then was a revision dated January 2011. Hmm. So all of a sudden, between January and July because there's another July version wandering around, they make these huge changes. Now, I've gone back and I have copies, scanned electronic copies that I've been able to find of iterations of the, the resident pistol revolver license going back to 1995. And I have put together a, a timeline showing how these questions have changed back and forth and here and there. Some haven't changed. But I don't know, there's no history of these guys doing anything except pulling it out of their little smoky bear hats. But I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> and, and I think you should because in our self-directed, self-governing society, it is supposed to be our electives that should be making all of these decisions. More and more we see them passing control and power to the administrative branch. I really do believe that if we're going to do this, let's do it the right way and make our Re House of Representatives and make our state Senate and ditto down in D.C. Make all those hard decisions instead of saying, eh, let's waffle it over and let the administrative branch do this so that we can protect our seats. But it's another thing altogether when the executive branch, Maggie Hassan 
or just the, the long-term bureaucrats say, we don't like the way things are. We don't think that this is good for our citizens, so therefore we shall just take it upon ourselves and do this. This is nuts. This is craziness. This is illegal. But worst of all, Susan and Steve, this is tyranny. Well, you know, our, our good friend uh, Ian Underwood said, you know, if, if the laws don't apply to them, why should they apply to us? And, you know, and, I, and I, the first time I heard that, I went, yikes. Yeah. But you know what? Apparently, these guys don't think the laws apply to them. And all of a sudden, maybe they've gotten caught. And I have no, I, I have no doubt in my mind that my license plate number is, is on a post-it note in every state police car in the state of New Hampshire. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. quite sure that any of us that are deemed to be subversive to the administrative state are probably already... Uh, well, I already know that I'm in a file in the yes, in you do. Department of Justice here in New Hampshire. And, well, uh, I'll tell you what. This, um, I'm not going to let go on this, and I've been chucked under the chin by a couple of folks and patted on the head and say, oh, my, 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 I'm sure. You know, this is just an oversight. Well, I'm calling BS. You know, I've kind of had enough. And 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 the the the, the Persian uh, and the Spartan um, conflict, man man caused conflict, you know, came up with that great statement. Um, you know what, boys? Um, come and take it. Yes. I'm, I'm I am not going to let this go. Well, you shouldn't because and, this clearly and, happened and, in the last six months, and somebody yes. needs to explain it. Yes. And if the commissioner. Uh, if this has happened without Commissioner Barholmes, or however you pronounce it, knowledge, uh, the, the fish still rots from the head down. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we do need to make more of an issue of it. And, you know, this is, this is a perfect example of citizen journalism, that a concerned citizen just caught something, and now, like the pit bull that I know that you are, even though I do call you more of a, a southern Texan bell from time to time with with that gleam in your eye when certain subjects come up. Um, this is something that you need to grab a hold of because it, it has to stop. And there also has to be a penalty for, for something like this. We were able, back uh, a couple of years ago, found out that various leftist uh, employees in... Uh, Segment's almost over. Oh, I'm sorry. But we basically made a rule change that kept uh, government employees from surfing the net when mm -hmm. they should be doing mm -hmm. their work. Mm -hmm. Keep at it, Susan, and um, trust me, we, we, you need to make this happen. Oh, just hide and watch, boys. Hide and watch. Well, you, didn't, didn't you say that we really should consider how many other forms they may have changed? Uh, indeed. Yeah, well, that's something everybody else out there needs to listen to. Uh, if you've got forms that you've had to fill out in the past, whether you were a business owner or whether you had to get certified for something or get a license to do this or that, go check the new form and see if there have been changes. Cause, uh, and if they need help? Call me. Okie dokie. There you go. What is going on? Something's launching in the background here. All right. Thanks so much, Susan, for taking time. Good luck with the phone banking, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. See ya. Take care. All right. That was segment three. Segment four is us, so live with it. <laughs> uh, this is Grok Talk. We will be back in just a few minutes. New Hampshire is famous for scenic drives, but they're tough to enjoy when you're on your way to the doctor. Because Obamacare limits your choices, some will have to drive more than an hour to see a doctor. What's health insurance worth if care isn't there when you need it? Jean Shaheen voted for Obamacare, putting your doctors and hospitals further out of reach. Tell Senator Shaheen, Obamacare is not working for New Hampshire. She tried to make us believe she was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Nancy Stiles has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, she claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along voting like a liberal Democrat. She voted to raise your gas tax by another 23%, taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. And oh, how she drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare. 
which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Stiles' vote. Call Senator Stiles at 603-918-0553 and tell her that we're on to her wolf and sheep's clothing routine. <laughs> tell her to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now the top of our list is voter fraud. You have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Welcome back. Hang on. Got to adjust my microphone and I didn't want to make a noise. Noise. So, this is Grok Talk, the last segment this week. That's true. And next week we'll be at the London Area Fish and Game Club for Andrew Hemingway's shoot. I don't know what the formal name is. Hemingway shoot. Hemingway shoot. Okay. It's a fundraiser. It's a fundraiser. It's a Hemingway shoot. And, and you uh, get to make lots of bangs. Lots of bangs. There'll be noise in the background. You'll your guns firing while we're on the air, maybe. Competitions, and Competitions, too, too, as yeah. well. And I'm quite sure that we, we will see a whole lot of... I mean, these kinds of things are always fun because you get to see all of your friends. Really. All, all, it's going to be a lot of conservatives, a lot of uh, grassroots activists that we see from time to time. We haven't been all that active in going to a lot of the events this year for various and sundry reasons, but uh, this will be one we'll be glad to go to, and frankly, it will be uh, will be allowable to let me try my newest edition, uh, which I think is will be wonderful. Oh right, yeah, on your hip. Yes, yes, that you cannot see on the live stream. Nope. Nor will you. No. Nope. But. Uh, um, I think it it will be lots of fun. Of course it will. But I'll bring the old standbys as well and just, just have a whale of a time. I'm quite sure somebody will bring stuff that will go really big booms if mm -hmm. struck at high speed with a rather heavy caliber. Yeah, there was uh, a tannerite. Yes. Yep. Yes. But uh, some some competitions. And, and, and frankly, I love it because it will get you a chance to to gab a lot. And also, everybody brings their stuff, and then you get a chance to fire all that stuff that you normally would otherwise not have the chance, and that's kind that's of true. fun. We'll get interviews. We'll get the people who are running for other offices. Obviously, we'll talk to Andrew Hemingway, but I'm quite sure that a number of other candidates will be willing to sit down with us. We'll get their views on stuff. We'll try to ask them some hard questions. And Well, that's the whole point to go into a thing like this, because there's going to be lots of guest potential. Yes. Target rich environment. Oh gosh, do you know how long I'll be editing video? Oh yeah. yeah. Long <laughs> time, long time. But long that's fun because that is part of our role. We just got off talking with Susan Olson uh, with her little bit of uh, citizen journalism, which I think is just, I mean, it's a great catch. It really is. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do. We, we certainly opine. We opine here on Grok Talk. We opine on the pages of Granite Grok, but we also do what I consider citizen journalism, because journalism is something that you do, not necessarily what you are. You don't have to be a paid professional to be doing good acts of journalism. Yeah, somebody sends you a tip, you follow up on it. You know, uh, he Skip mentioned um, uh, the uh, the web surfing um, union Miscreant. government employee, and that was a pretty good story for us. And uh, you know, I think that uh, when we discovered that John Lynch was running off to a secret meeting in Chicago with the multi-millionaire gay lobbyists that nobody knew about. That was a really good catch for us. Uh, we've had a lot of them. And, and sometimes, you know, you can do most of that on the web. I mean, most of the evidence is there, and then you just start posing questions that people don't want to answer. In other circumstances, you have a situation like Susan's where she had the ability to just come down to Concord and go to the right offices and ask the people in charge, hey, what can you tell me about this? Yeah, and catching uh, Kathy Sullivan, the former uh, 
New Hampshire uh, Democrat Party chair here in New Hampshire, Democrat Party, uh, I think she was on the executive committee at the national she level. She has been. Committee She's woman. also a committee woman, yeah. Yep. Uh, when she tried to do what what we called the Mini Disclosure Act, which was basically, you know, we f I fought that tooth and nail. That was be before everybody else joined me at Granite Rock. I was at MH Insider then, yeah. Yep. And we, we, were, we got a tip. We broke the story. We got everybody riled up. Uh, I even got a few Democrats to help out, those that were in favor of open and transparent government, mm -hmm. um, and it got stopped in our tracks. And so if you it wasn't for a Democrat in the New Hampshire House, that sucker would have passed, and Lynch would have signed it. Yeah, and, and so you know my dismay and my ire when I see that the Republicans, through SB 120, again, the usual suspects of Chuck Morris, Jeb Bradley, um, and all Sharon Carson, all those folks carrying the Democrat water for the Democrat agenda items, it just fills me with dismay. It really is. Um, I just, that part of citizen journalism is, is what we need more because we see the big papers, we see the TV stations and the radio stations getting away from it. And yeah, it, they don't cover the stuff we cover. No. And that's why when we go to these events, we do the video so you folks at home get a chance to see what we get the chance to see if you can't get there, either because you're too far away or you don't have the time or the wherewithal or the interest knowing that we'll bring it to you anyways. Um, and that's fine. That's what we try to do. That's the reason why we've invested in all this equipment so we can bring stuff to you that otherwise you can't. But uh, And you could donate to us to help pay for some of it. That wouldn't be a bad thing. The, the, yeah, because there's, uh, there's certainly more items. I still want a Grok drone. <laughs> well, if Martha Stewart can have one, why can't we? Well, she could probably have all the drones. She could probably have a big drone. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's got but, some money. But anyways, I promised I was going to ask you a question. You did. You didn't even tell me what it was. No. So I have no idea. Nope. So the last couple of nights as I kind of dream off to go off to dreamland, I keep, you know, I ask myself, what if... So I will ask you, given the current environment that you see here in America, if all of a sudden you were elected president, what would be some of the first acts you would do? What would what would be some of the things that you would do to put us back on the right track? Because poll after poll keeps saying the vast majority of Americans now, I think it's 71 percent is the latest poll, say we are going down the wrong set of tracks. What would you do? I think the first thing you need to do is to flush the executive of all this excessive extra constitutional bureaucracy. There's a lot of things that presidents have added. Obama's just the most recent to have added a ton. And uh, of course, all the czars can go right away. You don't need any of them. That's a huge budget bite right there. You need to go through your own house and clean it out. Then you need to go, what is really legitimate, and then systematically work with Congress to try to get rid of it all. If you get rid of it yourself, do it. And until the executive gives up all that power and gives it back to the Congress where it belongs, everything else is just a waste of time. What are some of the issues? There's the, you, you've just answered the question at the macro level. Give me some micro level. I don't really have micro level. So I think it's just a it's it's a principled issue. I mean, you can't. Obviously, there's a lot of departments that don't even need to exist. I don't know why we have a Department of Education. I don't know why we have a Department of Energy. I'm not entirely sure why we need the EPA. Um, you know, these aren't. I'm not saying that you clean out the whole cabinet. You need some advisors. You need some people to bring in who have some experience in these areas because a president isn't supposed to know everything. That's not their job. Uh, their job is to lead and to answer hard questions and to collect useful data from as many different places as possible to make those decisions. You can't do that if you just have all these. I mean, they don't want to make any decisions. They want all these other people, the bureaucrats. That's what we've been talking about the whole day here is giving away the authority. You have to get the authority back to Congress and the states. And you have to do everything you can as a leader, at least domestically, if that's where we want to start, because it's our government. And, and we're certainly not going to improve anything internationally until we really start straightening our asses out. But, you know, the inflation, the money printing, the, I mean, all of that crap has to stop. You really need to get things under control. I don't understand the monetary system well enough to say how to dial that back because of the printing and the bond buying and all that, but you have to do something about it. You've got to pull the regulations off the backs of business owners. There's a million things you got to do, but you can't begin to do that until you walk into the White House, look at the executive branch, and start doing some trimming. 
Okay, that's a good start. I mean, if I was going to change my life, I'd start with me, right? So, I mean, if you're the president, you start with you. It's your executive branch. You are in charge of all those bureaucracies. You need to do something. They're too big. I mean, what did Obama and the Democrats do? The first thing they did, they grew government by, what, 30% at least? Yes. Some agencies more. Get rid of it. They're not doing anything. We, uh, I mean, there's hundreds of programs, hundreds and hundreds of programs that are duplicates. I mean, they talk about getting rid of them. But that's all it ever turns out to be. Question one, could this be done better at the state? Check. It's theirs. Give it back to them. Maybe it takes a year to transition. Great. Whatever it dikes. Just put the money back in the hands of the states and let them experiment. Let them find better ways and let them work it out themselves. I mean, that's one reason why I keep saying, so what if the federal government shuts down? The only thing I worry about then is the military because that's what we need. That is a constitutional driver. That is a constitutional mandate. Yeah, something they're supposed to Everything do. Everything else. we got 50 other governments that can take over. Even the post office, which is part of the federal government could very easily be given away or sold off or or transferred to private Outsourced. Yeah. yeah I mean the, there's no reason for the federal government to waste tens of billions of dollars of year a year on a program they can't run effectively the other thing that drives us crazy is that we see the encroachment of the progressive state on the psyche of the American citizen you can't do that you didn't build that. How do we get back and restore the psyche? Is that part of the president's job to turn policies or the floor of government around to say, yes, you can, and we're going to either help you provide, provide the process or, or eliminate everything that's in that process out that shouldn't be there, where you can reach your destiny, as opposed to what... Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice, which, again, I got so much stuff to post, I can never get the time to do it, who basically, and the progressives like, uh, what's her name, Fluke? Sandra, Sandra Fluck. Yeah, Fluke, Fluck. It's Fluck. I don't know what it is. Who basically say, unless, they all, unless women all get contraceptives, they can never get to their true destiny. I think it's all tied to my original statement about pairing back the administrative state from the executive branch. The reason people think that those things are supposed to be done by the government is because the executive branch has assumed the power and right to do so. If as part of that exercise you explain to them that things would work a lot better if your governors and your elected representatives in your states had a better handle on the resources and the pulse of the people, that they would be better able to decide these things if that's what you wanted them to do. If not, you would be free to decide for yourself. How do we get the mindset of people, especially progressives, who believe only good things can flow from government and only government can do good things on a large scale? That's kind of what I'm looking at. And I look at people like Bill O'Brien, who actually cut the size of government and said, yeah, you need to have more responsibility for yourselves, which I don't think is a good thing. Because self respons I mean, which is not a bad thing. Because self-responsibility actually means and walks hand in hand with freedom. But how do we get to that point? Now, for instance, California is now about to add a huge entitlement. You know, a state that is in the leader of all things progressive and also one of the is probably in the hole for the, the largest amount of money in this in the country next to Illinois and you know it's a race between race to the bottom between the two. They're about to follow the example of Maggie Hassan here in New Hampshire. And do you know what that new program is gonna be? I don't remember, I'm sure I read it though. Diapers. <laughs> yeah. A few years ago, uh, it was found out that, and I've mentioned this uh, from time to time, $2 million was diverted from UNH by Maggie Hassan when she was a state senator to buy adult diapers because people couldn't afford adult diapers. Okay, now California, up to $100 million a year to supply baby diapers because otherwise single moms cannot reach the height of their destiny, all achieve and become... I've got the quote somewhere. I've just shut down the other laptop. They cannot achieve self-sufficiency without diapers. And I'm thinking, nothing says self-sufficiency than having to rely on government for your kids' diapers. 
As a president, it's not a, like it's like all the other <laughs> it, problems. It's the with mind. These. It's the mindset. It not- is the mindset. But that's the thing. I, I mean, as as the leader of the free world, you would have to say, "Look, it's your budget. They're your voters. I'm not paying for it. New Hampshire's not paying for your diapers. Florida's not paying for your diapers. Texas is not paying for your diapers. If you think this is a priority, and your citizens elect you to make it a priority, you pay for it. They pay for it. It's not." my job we're gonna take a break after i do this we'll be right back new hampshire is famous for scenic drives but they're tough to enjoy when you're on your way to the doctor because obamacare limits your choices some will have to drive more than an hour to see a doctor what's health insurance worth if care isn't there when you need it jean shaheen voted for obamacare putting your doctors and hospitals further out of reach Tell Senator Shaheen, Obamacare is not working for New Hampshire. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Or how were you pronouncing it earlier? Oh, God. What was I saying? <laughs> I don't even remember. I'll have to go listen. Listen to the pre-show. Oh, I, I, was, I had it all screwed up. <laughs> Whisco Tangy. Whisco Tangy uh, something. Anyway. Fix trip. We, we've had a couple of... Uh, if you listen to the pre-show, you already know that there are, were a couple of choices for us to uh, wade through as far as uh, re- the WTF moment of the week. And there, there really are always... Far too many to really just ignore them all, but we kind of have to pick one. And uh, Skip came up with uh, Skip came up with the best one for this week. We think. Which one was that? I uh, gave you several. You did. Um, uh, Martha's Vineyard. Operation, Operation Martha's Ma- Vineyard. Martha. Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. Here's here's the deal. We now have um, President Obama having to walk back his idea that w- the war has ended in Iraq. Well, well. <laughs> ISIS has basically ruined his reality, his progressive uh, daydream of how the world should be and presenting it as it is. Because, well, we're in the 21st century, according to President Obama. We don't act that way as country. You know, we, we don't invade other people, as they have talked about Russia and Ukraine. Well, Russia now owns Crimea, and now we see ISIS, the Islamic State, attempting to establish the Islamic Caliphate in Syria and Iraq and a bit of Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, and hope uh, it's looking like Jordan's going to be uh, part of that now, where, I mean, it's just exploding out of control. That's so. always what they wanted, too. That's what they wanted in Afghanistan. That's what they want in Iran. That's what they wanted in Libya. That's what they yeah. wanted in Somalia. They want an Islamic state from which to launch their terror mission around the globe. Especially at us. Mm-hmm. Now, so he's well, ordered the Israel military. Israel first, but then us, yes. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a close second. First the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good way of putting it. That's what it is. Yeah, the, the people of the book. Those are their words. Yep. So, so anyways, he's launched a military uh, operation, but it went nameless. Now, uh, there was somebody that I was listening to who said the military always has a name for their operations, and, and they usually are indicative of what it's for, but this one's gone nameless. Operation Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Yeah, well, uh, and we uh, changed it. I it's... guess a few people have, uh, in the military are going, well, what does this really mean? What is our purpose? What are we supposed to do? Make Obama and look nothing. like he's doing something. Yeah, and nothing has been come up for a name for this operation. And I heard some wag say this. It's, it's Operation Martha's Vineyard. Well, we've got Secretary of State, a.k.a. Lurch, a.k.a. A Live Shot, if we listen to Howie Carr, one of our uh, uh, likable radio announcers here, in uh, talk show hosts here in New, in New England. And um, you put up the post of Lurch on the pink girl's bike made uh, quite quite the impression on lots of people, but not for the reason that he wanted. I guess he was rather annoyed that somebody dared to take his picture. Now we've got Obama with crises. He's 
running all over the globe, what's he do? He heads for two weeks of vacation instead of manning his post to which he was elected. Mm-hmm. And, you know... Doing what op- he's good at. Y- yeah. Now, the uh, optics, yes, I understand. He's got all the communications that he needs to do all kinds of stuff at Martha's Vineyard. I get that. But the optics basically say, I'm just playing two weeks of golf. That's right. And so I think that this operation ought to be called Operation Martha's Vineyard. That's right. And that makes sense, too. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Then uh, Michelle can't be left out. I mean, <laughs> this is uh, Michelle Obama. There's irony. Michelle Obama says, no one really cares what you had for lunch. Yeah. What have I written? Like 20 posts because she cares about what people have for lunch? Well, school kids anyway. School kids, yes. Well, and, that's what she was talking about. And she she's was been talking sp- about people sharing pictures of their lunch. Because a lot of those pictures are pictures of lunches children were forced to eat because of her Let's Move program, which was passed in part of a bill uh, by the Democrats at uh, the end of 2010 before they were kicked out of office by the 2010 wave. They pushed a bunch of legislation through, including this lunch program that has had kids clamoring for something more. Yeah, and to the point where... Should it be the right of D.C.? Should they even have the possibility of people in D.C. like Michelle to be able to say in the furthest regions of our country, you can no longer do a bake sale to raise money for your team? A staple of American uh, lower education for decades, if not centuries. Bring stuff to eat to sell and raise money. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, but obesity. They're all our children, according to uh, all the progressives. In fact, Joe Biden's saying that all of these kids coming across our border are all our kids. But that gets away from that. the secondary WTF. Well, um, I have a surprise for them. I'm going to start claiming them as a tax exemption. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're going to be writing me a big freaking check. Yeah. So. so but, yeah, I thought that was rather ironical that uh, here she is saying, you know, kids – talking about her own too don't take pictures of your lunch do something else please don't take pictures of your lunch because it makes me look bad yeah yeah and i think i sent you was something else didn't carry starving africa shouldn't build more farms because it would contribute to global warming which we talked about in the pre-show if you were listening uh, yeah which once again we we see that uh you know we, we have these uppity progressives basically saying looking down their noses saying well our pet project global warming we cannot allow you to have a better living standard than what you already have. We're not going to allow you to feed yourself because, well, it kind of gets in the way of our narrative. Well, we're stuffing corn into gas tanks and making it too expensive. Yeah. What, uh, what's the name of that beef? Yagu beef? Ya- Yago? The, the expensive Japanese beef that costs like 30 oh, bucks oh, a pound. Oh, yeah. The, the, the Obama's. Wagyu. Wagyu. The, the Obama's whatever it is. serve at the White House all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they they get all the kinds of stuff, private chefs and all that type of deal. And, and, and like we're we, reading the instructions on the box of mac and cheese. Yeah, because hamburger has gone to $8.99 a pound. You, know, you can't even add it to your mac and cheese anymore. It's too expensive. No, no. So it, it gets to the point where you go, WTF. And, and this is our government doing it to us. They are too. Everything they're doing, all those regulations, all that, all that stuff is making it harder for people to keep people employed, harder to keep the prices down, harder to stay competitive, and that just passes right on to everybody else. And and I wonder when the LIVs, low information voters, are finally going to get it that there is cause and effect that if you put these kinds of people into office or demand more services from your government. This is the end result. And when the end comes, I think it's going to come very quickly, as Susan was talking about, with $18 trillion on our way to $19 trillion worth of debt. At what point does it become unpayable? At what point does just paying the debt service, the, the interest on that debt, become unserviceable? You know, at some point, it's going to take up all of the uh, national budget, and there will be no more money for entitlements. But yeah. nobody wants to game theory. Nobody wants to give up theirs. It's that free money you were talking about before. All of the local, you know, every succeeding lower level of government sees free money. And when do these idiots start to say, yeah, but our free money is going, our tax money is going to be somebody else's free money. And we're just perpetuating this, the cycle. 
When yeah. does it stop? Or is it going to stop only when the 100-mile-an-hour debt train hits the you know, 3,000-foot concrete wall? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's coming fast. I think, you know, that, that reminds me a lot of times when you go into town halls or not town halls because they don't have those around here because there's Democrats in office. When you um, uh, go to town meetings and, and stuff, you know, and, and uh, people talk about expenses in the town and the budgets and things. And there's always some state employee or some local employee that works in the town who gets paid by taxpayers who says, well, I pay taxes, too. No, that's a rebate. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If I stopped paying my taxes, you'd have no income to pay your taxes with. If the money runs out, if there's no money left, let's just hope that you saved a bunch because your job doesn't exist anymore. You aren't going to get a paycheck because there isn't anything to pay you with. Yeah, and what people oftentimes the government and the progressives and the left say profit that's a miserable concept capitalism yuck 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 yeah but the problem is that's where the tax money comes from it also serves as a yes there is a bug flying there around is. your head it also serves as a limiting principle that a company should only and can only spend to after some point only what it takes in and if it spends too much there's nothing left and it goes out of business the problem is we've gone way past that with government yeah. in that there is no limiting principle anymore it oh, works so it the thinks. same way for government and you but it doesn't employees. but it hasn't so no, far ultimately it does I mean like ultimately somebody said it I don't remember if it was Susan or Emily but sooner or later you know there isn't anything left to put in the paychecks there isn't anything to fund the programs it's just not there and that you know we've talked about it a million times here one of our major objections is a very moral objection to these entitlement programs you are trapping people in a system that is destined to fail you are going to punish them for your own political gain maybe not today maybe not next week maybe even not next year but they will become dependent on you and you as the breadwinner in their family are going to let them down your caveat in your mind is that maybe you just won't be in office when that happens that's just criminal yeah I have seen close up again I go back to when I was a daycare owner I've seen the multiple generations of the same family on welfare completely supported by the state these high and mighty progressives up in the nether regions of government in those rarefied areas of government they don't understand the ramifications of their own programs I've seen it close up I see what it does to their spirit very few of them ever climb out I've I've my boys dated some of these people and they said just sit here on the chair and be comfortable you know no aspirations at all And I'm going you are better than this but the lure of the money from somebody else of the lowest common denominator life is going to kill this country it is and it it's 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 a bribe it's a bribe to tell you not that you it's a bribe to tell you that you're incapable of building anything they want to make it a reality that you didn't build it because you can't get your ass off the couch you have yeah. no incentive and that's not how America became a great country correct so such Everybody sad... pulled the wagon back now. Are we at that tipping point where there's too many people in the wagon? There's an awful lot of people in the wagon. We don't want to have any money to fix the wagon either. No. <laughs> All right, next week, live from Londonderry Fish and Game in Londonderry, New Hampshire, with the Hemingway shoot. We will be there. Some of us will be there. I don't know who, but we will be there live, and we will share that with you, and it'll be more than two hours, I can guarantee you, but we'll be there with more news, more conversation, and more Grok Talk. Rock TV.